bring us through the gift of our baptism. The sign of your threefold name, the communion of your faithful people, the promise of your joyous realm, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, pour it out upon us in baptism. Let your grace and peace grow in us until we gather at your heavenly throne to give you thanks and praise forever. To Jesus Christ our Lord. God's grace, let us confess our sins. Praise to God, we confess that we have sinned against you, God, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We do not love you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have done. Help us stand in what we are. See 
seeds of your grace, peace, and hope planted deeply in our community. Amen. to know 
know what you ought to do, and then do not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand for the reading. Okay, 
so master group, so he's really speaking to the merchants here who says, this is what's happening. You think you're going to go and make a profit. You've got your plans all set. This is what's going to happen. And then I think James adds a cautionary note here that will apply a bit uh, to the situation in the faith community. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live. And do this or do that. Otherwise, you're boasting about your own pretentious plans. And all such boasting is actually evil. Let us pray. O Lord, let the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight. For truly you are indeed our strength, our rock, and our only redeemer. As we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think that we understand the uncertainty and the vicissitudes of life that cause us to be not quite certain about what the future is going to bring. We have just lived through it. Imagine, if you will, that you were getting ready to open a banquet hall in March of 2020. You had a book solid for the next year. And you're counting your dough, you're sitting there counting your dough, saying, hey, I really made it. And then all sudden. Overnight, the degree came down, shut you down. And then, you say, and by the way, we'll let you know when you can open again. When you can get out. What? Yeah. Real tough. So we, sometimes we thought of it from the perspective I had. I, I had been booked to do a wedding in near Detroit, Michigan for family friends. And, uh, daughter was actually the same age as my daughter, Emily, and so I know her since her birth, and they wanted me to do it, and they asked, could I go to Detroit to do it? And I said, sure, um, I'd be glad to do that. And so it was August 15th, then COVID hit. And then she said, what am I going to do? Put all the money down, what's going to do? And the governor of Michigan was not allowing them to come together. Not having, so she eventually had to relocate it here. She didn't have the wedding on. think about that, but I was thinking about the other side. So you're the business person, you're going to open that up, say, oh, no, what do I do? I'm going to do all my problems, all the stuff I've been working for. In some cases, a person might have put everything they had into the business that looked like it was going to be good. They had the bookings. Over here. You don't know what tomorrow is. Yeah. In the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I just happened to pick this up, it's not really about Bonhoeffer, but his father was a very world-renowned psychologist living in pre-war, pre-World War I, Germany. <clears throat> they go into the war, which by the way happened pretty much overnight. June of 1914, they go into war in August of 1914. That's when the event happened, June 28, 1914, when um, the uh, Archduke of Austria was assassinated in Sarajevo. They mobilize for war, and in August they're going to war. Everything changes. The whole life changes. Then after the war, there's hyperinflation. And he and his wife went out for their anniversary dinner, and they paid for it with a life insurance policy that they had. I remember reading that. Oh my God. He planned the right, right? He did the right thing. He had a life insurance policy, which was worthless. Interesting, you know how he survived? He survived because he took in money from other countries because he's world renowned. So he would get consultations or whatever, he would have them pay in that currency so it had value because the currency in Germany was worthless. When I was in the Soviet Union in 1991, this was one of those kind of memorable events. I had uh, flown into Kiev with the group. My luggage got lost. I thought, oh no, what's going to happen? These crazy companies, what are they going to do with my luggage? But you know, I'm thinking about that. And then, so that comes in, and so the next day I got to take a cab to the airport to get my luggage. And I had learned, in that short time, pay with rubles if you can. Because, I can't figure this out, their exchange rate was wacky. So like if you bought a pop for a dollar and you paid it with American money, you paid a dollar. But if you paid in rubles, it was the equivalent of five cents. 
I mean, go figure that out, right? I mean, why would that, should it be an even exchange? I mean, it wasn't. So I get to the cab and I say to the guy, I want to pay you in rubles. They got to take me to the airport. I got to pay you in rubles, which, you know, was an interesting conversation anyway, right? Because I was hoping he'd go take me to the airport. I didn't have any idea. What, he wasn't knowing what I was saying. But he looks at me and he says, rubles, toilet paper. <laughs> this is his country. All right? This is his money. He wants hard currency. By the way, it was against the law to pay hard currency. It was crazy. But, you know, they did. Lord's will for us to live 
And then what we want to do is what the team wants us to do. And that's what we're going to depend on. And I think what's lying underneath that is the biblical idea of the way life works. First of all, of course, uncertainty is built into the equation. We always think that sometimes we think in these terms, if I do this, then I'm going to lose. I see that, for example, with people who are very much involved in, uh, they go to the Y, and um, you know, you see these people and their work and their struggles, they're going on. And the best story I ever heard about this was a friend of ours, kind of an ancillary friend, but uh, he was 38 years old and he got in the best shape of his whole life. He was running, taking, you know, doing everything. He did that for a couple of years and he was really great. And then he looked at the statistics and saw, this is going to add, like, according to the statistics, a little bit to my longevity. But there's too many other factors involved. And he goes, eh, it's not worth it, I'm not going to do it. So he gave it up. I love that story. He said, that was it. It wasn't a bad shape, but, you know, that, that really intensive effort. And, you know, you've got quality of life issues. But in terms of longevity, turns out we don't really know why. There's, there's some things you can do that really can inhibit longevity, but in terms of guaranteeing it. Uh, I remember my brother, he figured out, he had gone, he said he was going to, according to his statistics, he was going to live to be in his middle 80s. That's what they told him. He was on track, of course. One day he got cancer. He was gone a year and a half later. That's the way it works. We don't know the future. I was thinking about, actually, I was thinking about coming over here. Three people, Susie, Brandon, and then um, another gal we know, all special needs, they weren't supposed to live. Their parents were told they would not live more than a short time. All of them exceeded it by at least three times, and then five times. What do you know? Who knows what? So uncertain, that's the way life is. So then we say, well, what matters? And that's really what the Bible is talking about. What matters? It's not going into the future. What matters? What matters is that I do the will of God. What matters is that I follow God's plan that is clear. And James has said, the royal law, the royal law is to love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another. To love God, to love others. That's what you're to do. I remember I was invited to speak at a youth thing. This was years ago. <laughs> Four years ago, sorry. It was at Edward Forest, which was a United Methodist camp in Northwestern Indiana. Butch and Lorraine lived right on the lake. And there was a little bit of a called Butch and Lorraine. And so they had this camp in there. I was to do a thing on um, knowing the will of God or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was. But the interesting thing was that there were talking all the time. These, you know, get, get, they're in high school, right? What's my future going to be? What's God's will for my future? And what who am I going to marry? All those kind of questions that you have. And after a while, it becomes overwhelming. You say, all I know for sure is the will of God is for you to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor and yourself wherever you are. Whatever your future holds. And then all of our plans, and it's all right to plan, of course, as long as we recognize that all they are is a kind of a path. We hope it works out. But the other thing is, sometimes what we hope to work out may actually not be the best for our lives. And it actually frequently isn't. I think I've all told you that I saw a statistic that said people who win the lottery, their lives get worse. Now you don't believe that, right? Because you know that if you won the lottery, it'd be great. It wouldn't apply to you. <laughs> if you want to screw your children up in the head really good, give them a lot of money. And we actually know that's the case. But it wouldn't happen to my kids, because I wouldn't make sure that it didn't happen. And yet it does. Over, over, over. It's the way it works. It's certain, but when we do the will of God, and following that plan, that's what works. Because unlike us, God has a certainty about the future. God has a way of knowing and does know what the future holds. We 
But it's interesting. I think it's very interesting in the Bible. Let's think about this for a moment. So they say, Lord, when will the when will it happen? And this passage we read today was only the first eight chapters of eight. But later on it's going to say, For even the Son does not know the hour or the day. There's this great hesitancy to say, okay, this is what's going to happen. We're going to lay it out for you. And I was kind of kicking, I always thought about that when they, when I heard these people come out and say, well, we've got to figure it out. My favorite story is of the guy who said that Christ was returning. He had to figure it out on such and such a date in 1844. I forgot the guy's name, but he was the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist. So, so it was going to be on this date in 1844. I think you all know that on, 18, on that date, the Lord didn't return, which is one thing. Okay, so you have a state. Then he said, and this is just too funny for work. He said, I got the date wrong. <laughs> it's this day. And he got people to believe him on the second day. Right? The first day, I think I would have said, oh, maybe. The second day, I would have said, I think you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Turns out he didn't. But, and the interesting thing is, it says right in the Bible that no one knows the day, the day or the hour. What well, we know. What we know is that it's a hand in God's time. And so what we do is live our life in accordance with God's will. Of course, as best we can determine it. But there's an awful lot that we can determine. That was my point with the, the teenagers. There's a lot of things we can know that we gotta do. We gotta be this way, we gotta follow these instructions. That's it. When we do that, then our lives are even when the circumstances are not always what we want. I'll tell you another funny one. I don't get this one either. So, if your life gets worse than in the lottery, your life gets better with the diagnosis of cancer. Hard to believe. I'm sure that's what the statistics say. You think about it, it makes sense. That has a way of really putting life in perspective. So you recognize what's important. Concentrate on those things. I had a relative in America. He was a grumpy old man. I loved him. He reminded me a lot of my father. So I knew how to deal with him. The rest of the family was terrified of him because he was this acerbic and forceful guy. He really had a tender heart. I remember one time he said to me, come, come, come over here. I want to complain about the relatives. He didn't say come.
willing, this will happen. But if it's not according to your will, then it won't. But we want it to. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue then with the recitation of the Nicene Creed. You please stand. Let us confess the faith of the one holy Catholic as universal and apostolic. We believe in one God. Remembering the world that God so loves, we pray to the maker of heaven and earth, saying, let your will be done. And we pray for the church, your whole church, your universal church. Write your covenant in our hearts, O Lord, so that we may live as your holy people and share our re your reconciling love with the world. Let your will be done. And of course, we pray for the world. Even as earthly kingdoms crumble and fall, which they do, show us a glimpse of your eternal realm, a new creation of righteousness and justice. Let your will be done. We pray for this community. Lift up the needy from ashes and dust and give them a place of honor so that all may rejoice in your grace. Let your will be done. And we pray for our loved ones. Help those who cry out from the depths. Show them the, your path of abundant life and give them fullness of joy in your presence. Let we'll, your will be done. And oh Lord, we pray for the concerns that we raise, uh, both vocally, of course, we pray for Marianne and for her recovery from her fall and broken arm. We also recognize that all of us are dealing with various issues of one kind or another. A lot of physical stuff, some emotional, dealing with the vicissitudes of life, and of course spiritual. We pray that you watch over us and help us and bless us and guide us by your spirit and let your healing power come to us in body, soul, mind, and spirit. We pray for those who grieve today. We pray for those who hurt today. We pray for those who suffer in one way or another. All those that we put in our prayers, all those we have in our hearts, watch over and bless. We pray as we have for our nation, for our world, for our leaders, that they would make right decisions. They too do not know what the future holds. So help them to do the right thing, that good things might happen because we're in a good position for that. Help us, Lord. Bless us. Thank you for your church. Thank you for this church and what it means in our lives. Help us always to be faithful. Including 
sovereign God, keep us watching and working for the promise of your heavenly realm. Until all the earth rejoices at your coming in glory, through Jesus Christ, the Lord of life. Amen. Let's turn together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You have promised to lift the poor from the dust and raise the dead from the grave. There is no one like you, O Lord. Therefore, we pray that you join the song of the Universal Church in the Heavenly Choir. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus taught us the signs of your coming realm. Though temples crumble and towers fall, we will not fear, for our hope is in you. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus on the night before he died took bread. And we give you thanks to you. He broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he took the cup. Gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is a new covenant. Sealed in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it as often as you shall drink it. And remembrance of me. Therefore, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Christ. Our Lord. Put your law in our hearts and minds, wash us body and soul by your grace, and give us hope that cannot be shaken. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we bless you, our Father, the God of glory, now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, so we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for you. Anything. The blood of Christ, cup of salvation. Take and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you.
of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always, both now and forever. Amen.